Mm. So I think we we can start now. So good morning, everyone. This is the the RIP interim meeting end of August. Um, um, and um, here is the agenda. So we're not so many people, but we're at least eight of us. Uh, maybe we should um, put the list, yeah, um, to the the, the codim. Um, this meeting is an, under Notwell, so if you are not aware of the Notwell, please take a look and read those. My guess is that all the people currently present are pretty familiar with that Notwell. Um, we have a pretty tough agenda, so. Um, do we have anyone to take the minutes? Is that um, Adam? I can try, but if we don't get to my presentation, can you? Can anyone help Adam? Um, especially because he's presenting. While Adam is presenting, I'll be happy to. Okay, thank you. Um. Yeah, so anyone has any comment um, on the agenda? No, I'm hearing no. So um, I suggest we start um, with the requirements uh, presentation. So Daniel, will you be uh, sharing the slides from your screen or do you want yeah. me to? Okay, so this is an update on requirements, which is now at Rev4. Next slide. So <clears throat> what I've done since 108 and didn't do, I did try to address every point that's been raised to the extent that I thought I understood them, and I'm pretty sure I didn't fully understand them. So hopefully we can clear some of that up today. Um, I didn't take suggestions that seem to me to be based upon the reviewer lacking context on unmanned aircraft systems. Instead, I added the missing context, which will hopefully clear up the confusion. Um, if there were suggestions that didn't seem to have consensus, I didn't necessarily take those. But if they get raised again and the working group expresses a consensus, obviously I will. Um, one point that we've gone back and forth on is, do we want the requirements document to be the glossary for all of the DRIP documents or not? Uh, currently, it is, um, but a lot of people have said, you know, what are all these terms here that you're defining but not using? Well, I've defined them because I figure they're going to be used in other DRIP documents, not requirements. But if the consensus is to take them out, I will take them out. I also had a couple of reviewers who suggested substantial restructuring of the document. I have not done that. Um, the current structure of the document is what we kind of evolved to based upon uh, prior inputs. Um, but if there is a consensus that we need to restructure it, then so be it, I will. And then finally, there's a bunch of little minor corrections and final proofreading that, that need to be done subsequent to, to all that. Next slide, please. Okay, so uh, Michael Richardson um, has indicated that the uh, general requirement number one actually has multiple sub-requirements, if you will, embedded in it, and he has suggested that perhaps we might want to explode Gen 1 into separate numbered requirements um, for those things. And those are the five things that he identified as being uh, either explicit or implicit in uh, Gen 1. And we'll see Gen 1 on the next slide. So um, all of my remaining slides are, uh, back up if you would, um, we're, we're, we're Screaming ahead in the slides. Um, yeah. Right. I don't know why you jumped uh, so okay. fast. There we go. Um, yeah, so all of the remaining slides are the actual text of the numbered requirements um, from the draft. <coughs> Excuse me. So um, these first three requirements here are um, as they have been uh, for a couple months now. 
Uh, no change here. The only question is whether we want to expand Gen 1 into multiple requirements. So any discussion on that? Um, yeah, I, I, I think I, I kind of um, uh, concur with Michael that uh, this requirement, uh, I mean, it, it's very personal. I mean, um, so I'm happy to hear all the words. But I have the impression this, uh, this uh, requirement got um, multiple things in it. Um, and those are different characteristics, so the different requirements. So um, I'm not saying that it should end up in, into five requirements, but uh, maybe there is a middle ground with that. Um, I can't yeah. agree with it more than I thought about it a, a little bit uh, because the, uh, you know, which feature we do which one of those points uh, and and when we look at the different messaging and the rest of it uh, how that works in there can be value in breaking it out um, to allow people to focus on you know, what each piece provides so I'll give it some more thought okay and the, the other um... I think so. Maybe that was a um, a, a lake of um, UAS um, context, but um, um, I, I found that um, um, specific. I mean, um, I, I don't understand why why we we said the current sender of the message. Um, uh, maybe I, I don't know if the the way. The requirements are expressed in the simplest way to to do that. So that was my, I mean, I think one of my concerns when I first read those requirements. But um, um, yeah, mean, that, that was one of the areas where I added some more uh, context outside of the numbered requirements themselves that should help clear that up. Um, the the reason is. With broadcast remote ID, we have many very short messages and um, conventional internet world ways of um, of connecting the message with the sender are not available to us. We don't we don't even have a session. We don't have a connection. We don't have bidirectional communications. And so uh, there'll be, uh, you know, think of it as a whole bunch of really tiny UDP datagrams, one after another. And how do we know that the n plus oneth datagram actually came from the same sender as the nth datagram, where the nth datagram contained the identity of the sender, whereas the n plus oneth datagram contained the location uh, alleged of the sender? So that's that's what leads to that uh, rather odd wording. Okay, but the sender is, um, I mean. Um... It can be the, the drone itself or uh, the GSC, for example. Yeah, that depends upon whether it is um, broadcast remote ID, in which case it will be the aircraft itself, or if it is network remote ID, in which case it can either be the aircraft or the ground control station. But w when we are speaking at the U uh, speaking of the UAS, um, it, it, it can be broadcast. I mean, the drone. My understanding, and maybe that that's uh, I am wrong in in that. But I, I expect that the drone can broadcast, or maybe if it has a direct internet connection, it could. Uh, um, I mean, um, send the message directly to the provider. That's broadcast versus network, Daniel. Yeah. Uh, and broadcast in, in every document assumes that is coming from what is up in the air, whereas network could come from either, could come from the ground station, the ground control station, or come from the item in the air. Um, they are um, both um, allowed to do the network connection. Uh, of course. Uh, ground control station to tell where the, the the thing in the air is, it's assuming it's getting the information through its command and control link. Yeah. But right. so and, and uh, yeah. when it is broadcast from the aircraft, it's not IP and it's not bidirectional. 
Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, sure. But um Okay, but in this case, what we want to secure is the communications between uh, the provider. I mean, the, the ID, ID is um, is important um, for the provider and the UAS. The UAS might be um, GSC or the UA. Am I correct? I'm not sure what entity you're referring to as the provider. Okay, so... Uh, I mean, the one collecting the location information, for example. So in the case of broadcast ID, that's um, that's any observer with a, a Bluetooth uh, receiver or a Wi-Fi neighbor awareness networking receiver who's getting it on a direct, you know, uh, layer two data link um, from the aircraft. Okay. Okay, so we have those broadcasts. Uh, okay. So it's a non-IP communication in that case. Correct. Okay. And um, and this ID should be should work on a non-IP communication, which means the ID itself should be. I mean, do do we have an IP communication that uh, even in the no, broadcast? The, no. Yeah, the, the the broadcast remote ID is non-IP, and there is no room for IP even with okay. things like robust header correction uh, compression. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So that those those were just my comments. Okay. So do we want to move on to the next slide? I think the cat said no. Yes, that's the noisiest cat I've ever had. Okay. So these next uh, three requirements are unchanged, um, but I will mention that uh, at kind of the um, late in the game, I got a comment that readability, uh, general requirement number four, um, may not really belong here at all um, because the required elements of information are pre-specified, uh, not by us, and the formats that they are in is are pre-specified in the case of broadcast, not pre-specified in the case of network remote ID. And so in most cases, these things are packed, uh, you know, binary fields that no human is going to be able to directly eyeball them. They're going to have to be, you know, parsed by software and then, you know, lookup tables consulted to say, oh, well, a type three is a helicopter or whatever. Um, so uh, I don't know. We, we may want to uh, ponder whether the readability requirement really belongs or not. Um, but other than making that point, let's move on to the next slide. All right, these general requirements also uh, remain as they have been for uh, the last couple of months. And uh, there is some, in each of the requirements sections, the numbered requirements, I've added explanatory text um, at the bottom. I don't want to put explanatory text in the numbered requirement because that encumbers the numbered requirement with, you know, interpretation and so on. I want to keep the numbered requirements as, as short and crisp as possible. And yet at the same time, they do require a little bit of uh, context. And yes, even the GCS uh, could be mobile. Uh, next slide. Okay, so now we move into identifier requirements. And um, you know, there, there is, you know, I've tried to group the requirements just to make them manageable, but there's clearly some overlap. For instance, the uh, unlinkability requirement on the identifier could be considered a, a privacy requirement. Um, now, I've had that uh, caveat in there of within a to-be-defined scope since the very beginning, because when we first started writing these, you, we weren't sure what the scope was going to be, and I was kind of hoping that the scope would emerge. Well, the scope has not yet emerged, and um, you know, one of our co-chairs has suggested that we should, at this point, take a whack at defining it. I don't know if anyone has any suggestions on what the necessary scope of uniqueness might be here. Yeah, because um, as far as I remember, my concern was that if we mention it has to be unique, but we have a, only a limited space for those IDs, um, I mean, they won't be unique for a long time. 
Right. And in the solution space side, we have an idea on how to handle that. Um, but on the requirement side, we probably ought to say, you know, how wide and how long this uniqueness is required to hold for. Um, yeah, it, it, maybe that's um, the, the way you see that is a little bit too specific. So um, maybe must provide some mechanisms so that we don't end up into collisions or something like that. I, I think there's there is actual wording in the uh, in, in, in 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 FAA CONOPS about uh, um, avoiding um, an ID being used um, there in, in any operational conflict. So there might be wording we can we can use there for making a, how unique an ID has to be. Okay, see if I'll go look for that it. in the NPRM. Yeah, I'll look for that in the NPRM and in the uh, uh, EASA uh, documents. One thing I do know is they're talking about hanging on to this information for six months. So uh, an identifier uh, has no relevance uh, after a six month period at the outside. So um, next slide, I guess. Yeah, so, but just um, the reason is that, I mean, um, when I look at this requirement, the identifier must be unique and whatever solution you're going to bring to because of that space, if we compare those to the requirement, we will be able to say, yeah, no, it's not unique. So that's the thing I'm sort of trying to avoid um, so that the solution really match the requirements at the end. That's reasonable. Understood. So here's where most of the action is, the privacy requirements. Um, Priv1 confidential handling is unchanged. Um, Priv3 encrypted storage, um, as of IETF 108, it had been um, narrowed uh, based upon prior debate. And at the time of IETF 108, we didn't have much discussion of any further change to that. Uh, Priv2 encrypted transport uh, we've been going back and forth on this because on the one hand, we're trying to provide privacy, but on the other hand, when safety is involved, uh, transparency trumps privacy, um, but that transparency is not necessarily to all parties. It's only to those parties who are charged with responsibility for safety and, and so on. So this is, this is the latest attempt that I have made at reconciling the, um, the two ends of that uh, contest. And I hope everybody can just stare at this for a minute and, and say what they have to say about it. I, I'm good. This is, this follows much of way my thinkings after I've delved through the documents and it's pretty much, you know, what I follow in my uh, draft. So I'm basically meeting the, this particular um, requirement by what I'm doing, proposing. Not going to be short. Okay, good. Okay, then I guess next slide. <laughs> I'm just wondering about the, the storage. Um, if that's in scope of, um, but that's, um, let's move on. Well, and actually you'll find something about that in the explanatory text. Um, oh. So on these slides, I've not bothered to uh, present the explanatory test in text from any of the other requirements sections, but mm -hmm. I have for the privacy requirements, which is where most of the debate has been. So uh, Priv 4, designation, that's a new requirement. Uh, this results from uh, Amelia's uh, review. Um, it's meaningless to say this is what we're going to do with private information. This is what we're going to do with public information if we don't have mechanisms for determining what is public information and what is private information. Um, and then uh, a suggestion from uh, Michael Richardson, which I found uh, fascinating, was that uh, perhaps we wish to support a pseudonymous uh, rendezvous function where participants uh, may choose to make themselves uh, mutually reachable uh, while uh, continuing to mask um, the actual name of the pilot and the physical location uh, of the pilot. 
So I, I don't know whether we want that one in there or not. I, I made it a may. And then if we look at the explanatory text, how information is actually stored on end systems is out of scope for DRIPS. That refers back to PRIV3. However, encouraging best practices, including end system storage encryption by facilitating it with appropriate protocol design is in scope. And then similar logic applies to the designation requirement, PRIV4. So that was, that was the balancing act that we tried to strike between really wanting to encourage privacy best practices, but also not wanting to go outside of IETF, uh, you know, protocol competence and get into what goes on on the, you know, IT end systems. Yeah. So it basically says that I can talk to the pilot of that drone without knowing it's two. Yeah, that would be the new Priv 5 uh, requirement, yes. Yeah. And, and it's not really a requirement because it's a May. Yeah, why do you think it's um, it's it should not be a should? I'd be quite happy to upgrade it to a should if that's the WG consensus. The, the real benefit of that, of course, is that um, two operators who are sharing an airspace volume uh, may need to do what's referred to as tactical deconfliction or self separation. And when this is automated, it's referred to as detect and avoid, you know, that the aircraft is going to have a radar mm -hmm. or whatever. It's going to see the other aircraft. It's going to maneuver so they don't collide. Um, but before you get anywhere near close enough to even have to worry about that, it could be very helpful if the two operators could talk to each other and say, well, you know, uh, I'm going to fly high. Why don't you fly low and we'll, you know, avoid each other that way and, and never get even close enough to have to worry about a, a collision. But that does not necessarily mean that I wish to reveal who I am and where I am physically sitting at the, at the joystick of my aircraft. Yeah, I, 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 it looks to me, but I'm not from from that environment. That um, we, I mean, uh, there is no much difference between a may and a should, because um, if I mean, in either case, uh, if we have it, it's good. Um, if we don't have it, it's not going to prevent um, um, the solution. So, uh, I, I, I agree that that it's not required. I think that the the interesting thing is, um, I joked it's a dating app, but but actually is, hey, did you get cover footage of my drone doing blah? Okay, and and I think that that by enabling it for, I think that by enabling this as a uh, for something other than just um, security um, and tracking, that it will probably get some additional. Um, traction in mind share in people um but it may also be like you know something like i just fo i just um got footage of a mugging but i didn't catch his the mugger's face did you get it right um so that's my my feeling on that so does anyone have any objection to upgrading the may to a should Okay, yeah, I will I will so revise it and I believe this was my last slide and I'm out of time. Okay, hey, good. So any comments? So my my take on this uh presentation is that um we do I, I'd like to understand how people think the, the draft is ready for working group last call. Um, I have any way to, to talk to my co-chair, uh, but um, um, let's uh, put it this way. Um, do we think that we can start a working group last call uh, September 1st? Yes. Okay. So a anyone thinks the draft is not ready? for a working group last call? I think we do need to get the Gen 1 
um, changes in and go uh, 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 a review of that the list, and then we can call for work group last call. Okay, yeah, that's um, that's correct. Okay, um, and, and also my point that priv three should become priv five because of the nature of that where four and five should become three and four. Yeah. So yeah, um, I mean we do have some very minor changes, but um, mm -hmm. overall my take is that the next version could be discussed one week on the working group, and then we are pretty much ready to start a working group last call. Um, yeah, so the, for the working group last call, I'd like to reach out um, other organizations um, just for them to to show them that we are making progress and they might come with some other comments. Um, in any case, the requirement draft, um, I'm not sure about wh whether we should um, um, have a long working group last call, so just to take the time to, to get additional requirements and so on. Um, but in any case, that should not prevent um, the, us to start the solution um, in any case. So um, that's um, a little bit what I am thinking of, uh, having a long working group last call so that we have the time to, to gather additional requirements and discussions, if they are. Anyone has an um, opinion on that or? I, except for that being August, still, yeah. I don't, I mean, I think you might want to extend it for that reason to not start it till after Labor Day. But aside from that, I don't see any reason to make it a particularly long. Um, I think that either the requirements have arrived or they haven't. And I don't think making it longer will do anything except making it longer. Okay. Um, Salo is on the call here, and uh, maybe he can chime in with the IKO um, virtual com uh, conference being the end of September. Uh, whether anything like this would be a value for presenting um, there. So, are you suggesting that we should end up that before end of September or just after so that we can get the comments from the IKO? I would think we should give IKO some time there for yeah. this coming again. So we should set you know, the, the time. So I just mentioned I'm gone, pretty much gone the first week of October. Comments are being out and, uh, and I'll be still be around. Kind of. So yeah. Finish it up. Yeah. Okay. So. Yeah. So yeah, when I was thinking of a long working group last call, I did not expect a six months, but something like maybe a, a month. Okay, so um, uh, Michael, do you think um, having the wall September, uh, let, let's say uh, September, Mid September until October fifteen is um is unnecessary. Sounds too long. I I think you should you're losing focus to do that. But okay, I I I just don't. I, I this is a working group last call, and I think that generally we don't get a lot of last call comments until it goes out to review. If you're going to go get cross area review, that's maybe a different story. Uh, you probably are. So okay, yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah we Michael still have a good that. Point. Yeah. Yeah, good point, Michael. So yeah, we, we will have a two weeks um, and let the people um, know that they, they have a two weeks, so they might uh, send comments uh, four weeks after, but um, we will still have the ITF last call. So yeah, good point. And perhaps start that on September 8th, the day after Labor Day? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so now, Bob. Okay, um, we're now getting to actual solution space, and uh, I do. See, I see a RID, uh, US RID 04, It's actually 05, uh, which that I uh, published uh, here. 
So we go on to the next slide. And the the TRIPS goal is to specify how remote ID can be made trustworthy and available in both internet and local only connected scenarios. That's what we put in our charter. That's what I'm, what I'm addressing. Next slide. So local only, is that the broadcast or? It's the broadcast. That's, okay. that's what we have in our charter. We call local only, but what we meant there was um, um, that is the broadcast over whatever radio connection the unmanned aircraft is using. Okay. And, um, the we are we are limited by the outside groups which have find some of the things here. Uh, we are um, working within uh, Bluetooth 4 frames, so the, uh, they said that 20 characters maximum for the, uh, um, this ID. I will point out that the original um, ANSI um, for manufacture ID from an aircraft was 24 characters, and they had to power down and reissue that um, to 20 characters. So this 20 characters is recognized as um, you got to live within 20 characters. Um, the humanistic be globally unique, um, that there's some ways that uh, you can, you know, some, some mechanism to, to assure that it's global uniqueness. Um, time period, I don't specify here, but just that at any point in time, it's um, deterministically globally unique. Um, Stu did point out that, uh, you know, in various documents are saying for six months after it's used, uh, it can't be reused by anything other than what used it. Um, Non-spoofable. Approval ownership without internet lookup um, in 200 bytes because that is the maximum size for any which the, uh, the which the authentication messages work with, so we got to do it in in that that particular name. Much better for performance um, when if you can look um, the, um, as Adam has found out in operational sense, um, getting that many chained together Bluetooth four packets actually received is challenging. Uh, so it's better is less. So those are the design goals. Moving on. So just for me, the 200 bytes are the, the size of the packet, and you want the ID, some information, and the proof of ownership within one packet. What, one Bluetooth 5 packet or 10 Bluetooth 4 packets. OK. And 10 is a Bluetooth restriction. Um. It's not a Bluetooth restriction, but in terms of practicality, as Adam is finding out, um, receiving more of them, is, if you look at time and movement, how, I don't know, how long you would have to be in space to be able to receive them. There are some physical limitations. You say, well, can we do 12? Okay. You know, so so we, we kind of draw it through the line of 10. This line even before us. In fact, some said, let's keep down to five. And we said, no, let's go to 10. Okay. Um, and that maps to, to Bluetooth 5 from size. That's the payload size for Bluetooth 5. Okay, so one Bluetooth 5 packet. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, one Bluetooth 5 is roughly equivalent to 10 Bluetooth 4. Okay. Except one byte, and then. <laughs> yeah. And um, I provided a link that gives a really nice uh, layout and how much time it takes to send those from from the Bluetooth um, org site that that also you know, these these actual messages take. So, which comes into again accounting, figuring out like uh, how long should it take to receive this kind of a thing. Okay, so more design considerations. A registry is a registered string equivalent to non-spoofable. Um, example is, is an ANSI CTSA serial number and RFID EPC registered strings. 
But we we expect lying and stealing. We have basically uh, with the NCTT through an expect to see lying and stealing. Um, there's no compass any lucrative for actionable information. Uh, there's nothing that says when you scan that uh, you know to get that RFID off that uh, thing on the shelf that that's not um, fraudulent. So that's the problem with, with just a registered string. There is no real trust in it. On more to the next slide. Non-spoofable. Well, they're spoofable, but the name in them is spoofable because there are multiple routes. And who to trust on the name? We have seen uh, where, where we seen um, domain name uh, being fraudulently placed elsewhere. Those typically caught and, and uh, after the damage is done, uh, but uh, there is no. Um, guarantee that a name you see in a certificate that's the only certificate you'll see that name in. Um, simultaneous submissions in different routes, who wins, that's that's another issue. This, by the way, is coming up in discussions in the uh, digital identity work group inside IAO where they're talking about um, um, any craft to other things they're they're looking at how they're going to be able to manage this sort of thing in their uh, PKI model it's actually you know discuss four certificate uses for 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 manned aircraft and manned services so this, this, this is recognized uh, so can they just certificates as being non spoofable uh, or the certificates being non spoofable yeah. um but just one thing, when you, you mentioned the 20 byte, uh, 20 character, um, is that 20 bytes? 20 bytes. Yeah, it's not an um, ASCII character then, okay. It's, 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 it's right, it's correct. You have yeah. 20 bytes which you work with. Uh, it is assumed that it is a uh, ASCII, uh, ASCII uh, that, um, okay. It's not necessarily hold in some uses. Okay, well, right. I don't understand what you mean by certificates are not non-spoofable. Um, I say certificates are spoof and nothing else uh, a similar certificate uh, by he and uh, Doing this, so it's unspeakable. But the subject in certificate can be in a name is spoofable. The certificate does not prove that that name is don't name that thing. I think that depends on the certificate policy and whether the CA is following the rules. Um, Whatever those but, are under the CERT policy. Well, but you have multiple CAs. You don't have a single CA. That would assume that there's only one CA. Or that the CAs divvy up the namespace, such as is done with the RPKI. Um, yes. And uh, in, in, a, in a global space like this, there are um, various reasons to not follow rules like that um, in certain places where there's gaming that can be done. Uh, IKO is looking at being active in, in the uh, digital identity work group. And uh, their next meeting is, uh, they, they've been on hay for the summer, um, but they're restarting uh, September 1. And, and we'll see where, where that goes in discussions there. I did not want to be bounded by by them coming with, with saying that there will be a single um, CA domain space, which will, or no, PI space, which will regulate or name all naming. So they if have, there, the IKO is going to run a route for the PKI, 
then they can audit their subordinates and throw people out who don't follow the rules. Right now, they run a bridge CA, but they're expanding that to federated model. That doesn't change what I just said. Well, then there's no root CA. It's a federated model. But it's but there's still the audit requirement that the CP could impose. Mm hmm. After the fact, after the damage has been done. So if you don't trust your CAs, then you're uh, that you can't trust the names. I agree with that. If that's what you're trying to say, um, I'm. I'm I, I'm leery. I'm gun shy, Russ. And they shouldn't be so leery and so gun. So, so, Russ, can you just repeat? I'm saying if there's a certificate policy that's set out and all of the CAs are audited against that policy, if somebody's violating the policy, they're going to get caught. Yeah. Um, I'll, I, should, I should be able to send you the current certificate policy, Russ. They're at draft point six. Um, I don't think it's from what uh, um, um, Mike, uh, um, 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 good fellow at Ontario, it's, it's not a secret document. Um, I, I'll, I'll send it to you and I'll be interested in your comments if you if you want to spend some time looking. It's not, it, it's a typical CA policy. I'm certainly willing to take a look at it. Okay. I made I made a note down to, to, to support it to you. So, Jan. Um, to be trusted, not provable. An algorithm on trusted information is a yield has public key um, into the identity. So that's that's the this on how the public key was proved by the private key and the identity it's uh it's stuff we've, we've talked with and dealt with some time for some for some time next slide please um oh. i think bob we have problem hearing you oh you can hear me um yeah sorry but can you hear me now it was okay yeah to my mic okay maybe I bump my bump my mic um, okay, so please uh, restart with that slide. I think. Okay. Um, am I? This this is a, I've extracted this text from the this slide from the in in the draft. Um, to be trustful, non spoofable identity needs to be self asserting, and by that I mean identity is trust information that is a public key, and it's an algorithm that's used on this trust information. That is the public key um, to yield identity. That is, take a hash of the public key to to make the identity, um, and the fixed length result is best for using elsewhere. After all, we have to fit this into twenty bytes. Globally, make this. Hierarchy. Uh, statistical uniqueness is not sufficient. That in HIP we had an experiment on distributed hash tables um, to, to have global uniqueness, and there were some lessons learned about a global distributed hash table to achieve that. Um, 
and it was not really satisfactory. Um, so include hierarchy into the identity. Um, include in the hash algorithm for non-spoofable hierarchy. So you set up a hierarchy for the identities, and and you include that ident that hierarchy designation in your hash into the identity, um, so that there is a trust of that hierarchy. Trust of the weakness. Identified is the host entity tag from our support. It lacks hierarchy, which is an easy add. Um, or cryptographically generated addresses, which is RC3972, um, which doesn't really handle crypto agility well. Um, there was work in 4982 to fix it, but the fixes of limited scope least in the reading of it. Um, and it has a loose hierarchy in the IPv6 prefix, um, but there is no bounding of that prefix, um, and, and it's hard to limit and control that, uh, higher, that prefix with the CGA for use here in remote ID in the way that CGA is currently defined. Maybe Andre, who's worked with CGA, might have something to say on that. Otherwise, we can go on. Um, so the host identity has added a hierarchy. Uh, I point out that though I list the draft you put it, you uh, I've taken all this text and it's now in an appendix. I think it's appendix A in uh, in the draft. Uh, I did not update this particular part of the si slide. Uh, uh, that had requested that everything needed be in one draft, having to go to multiple drafts, as well as an, an ownership issue in moving uh, um, hip hierarchical hit forward. So you don't need to look at this draft anymore. Let's look at in the US RID draft. Uh, we had earlier back in November discussion on the list. I originally had a, a 14, 18 to, um, break up of the 32 bits. I now have it 16, 16, um, but it is open discussion, maybe on a better uh, partitioning. Uh, and can have uh, I've chosen EDDSA 25519 with CSHAKE 128 for the uh, um, the public key. Um, uh, the nice thing about uh, EDDSA 25519 is uh, issues, and uh, um, CSHAKE is neat. It offers a number of, of useful things moving down forward down the road uh, over uh, using SHAW-2. Also makes it much simpler uh, in, in saying what is your out length, as that is one of the algorithms in the Continue, please. Um, global uniqueness, um, how you achieve that. I had originally written a draft uh, on registries, uh, but since I wrote that draft, um, we've been having a discussion with uh, um, uh, Mike Pallet uh, about EPP, and there's reasons to go that way instead. When I get work, get some, some text from Mike, I will pull the reference of the the hierarchy registry, replace that with EPP instead. Uh, I think that's a, a, a much better business place to, to achieve it and leverage off what currently exists. Um, look up here, I'm kind of uh, open. I have a model in the draft of how I've, how I've done it. I'm, I'm open for some people to say um, a bit. Uh, uh, better or simpler approach to how the lookup would work. Um, please please look at the draft and please comment 
development. Um, and RDAP is, is the other approach. Um, there, there's going to be more initiatives, but that's inside RDAP. Uh, you start with your RDAP, and then the, however that works, find out the one that really has it registered. Uh, that may well, again, tie into the whole USS model. Uh, and again, we're going to need text for RDAP in the draft, at least referencing it. So I'm just asking, um, is the sound better for everyone, or should we restart a little bit? I can tell you who's dropping in and out. I'm dropping in and out. That's awful. I'm sorry about that. Uh, uh, so the I think the way forward for the global uniqueness and the lookup is leveraging EPP and RDAP. That's not what's in the draft, and I'll be needing text to add to that. Um, the I should um, say the key part. I don't claim I have the best um, DNS structures for up, and I'm interested in comments um, on how on improvements on that. I'm, I'm open on on, on what, where we may go forward on that. Part of that may tie in with IKO's DNS direction which is, uh, I don't know if that's going to be from the grain work group that I'm active in. We're discussing it there. Um, and having a private public um, DNS structures. So there might be something there down the road. That still really in its early stages, in my opinion. They were their own level domain that's like two years out. So here is the requirements which I meet um, and we can discuss how well I meet them. Um, the provable ownership, of course, um, it's not the remote leverages the ability to perform for um, approval ownership through the auth messages and the same with binding and the registration. Uh, it, it's a thing that you can now do these steps with. So we can debate whether um, I actually have requirements or I facilitate what I've done elsewhere. And I'm open to question on that fine point. Uh, it does um, specify uh, meet the length and, and uh, uniqueness, and, and uh, again the non spoofability that again in its use it, in and of itself, it's it's how it's used which provides the non spoofability. So again, am I facilitating non spoofability or am I? We can discuss that fine point and how to resolve that within the text of the draft. Um, and uh, Reg 1 and 2, the same thing. It provides a mechanism for both public and private lookups. It doesn't, it doesn't provide it directly. So here's how using this we can do that. So does this mean I met those requirements or? I'm facilitating other things meeting those frequent comments based on this. Bob, I think you're also facilitating the last of the ID requirements, number six, because while a hierarchical host identity tag is not inherently unlinkable, they are cheap to generate, use once, and then throw away. So they're entirely compatible with uh, single use for unlinkability. Okay, I will add that in. And then we can have another thing to discuss, but yes. But this is, this is an important point that uh, remote the, the here does not give some of these these requirements. But without what I'm doing, nothing else can meet these requirements. So how does that work? And 
people from these things in other IETF um, areas, I'd be interested in how they see this. Um, so the updates, what came up, the big thing are there's that Bob put everything in one draft, which is interesting because back in November, people would say, Bob, tear this apart in separate drafts. <laughs> okay, fine, never mind. So I work and I believe I've gotten everything together. I don't claim I have everything exactly right. Please review the dependencies, how I struck it. I had everything well put together and you can follow how each piece leads into the next. Um, so that, I mean, I, I just, well, that was just a major cut and pasting with, with Ed's job. So, uh, other uh, but I consider this document is ready for. Um, I I believe that this to remote ID, uh, which we can we can produce. Nobody else has come up with any authors. We are working in a highly constrained environment, and uh, you have to deal with that. Uh, it may be interesting. I've been trying to find the leverage of, of, of how this may work also in Mannercraft, and actually we're talking about that in the Tron working group uh, in the use cases. So that may come up in the beyond just unmanned aircraft into uh, manned aircraft as well. So that's I want to get all this going. We can have something strong to point to in, in the IKO discussions. So um, I'm just wondering how many people think this um, work is um, ready for adoption? You can put a, a plus one in the chat if you. And how many people are willing to review the document? I need reviewers, please. Yeah. Um, okay. Anyone they, thinking? They, they, it's not ready. I don't see anyone opposing to that, so I will check that with my co-chair. And um, it's um, it's likely that um, we start a call for adoption um, very soon. Okay. Next, I Thank think you. we're a little bit um, we're a little bit late. Um, um, yeah, it's so twelve o'clock right now. Should we stop now and leave the other uh, presentation for the next interim meeting? I think we have enough work for now. Okay, Russ is dropping. Yeah, um, I, yeah, I think we should move uh, my stuff and operator privacy to the next interim. Definitely because I feel like I need to really dig deep into the formats okay. and the identity claims because there are topics we have not touched in detail. I mean, we have drafts they've been being iterated over and they have implementations here, but like, I don't know how much has been reviewed and it's going it's not going to be a simple, oh, here's a touch and go. It's going to be a little bit of a deeper dive. Okay. Yeah. So um so I, I think the, the meeting is adjourned for today. We we'll postpone all the, the other presentation for the next interim meeting. So my take is that uh we're waiting for a new version of the requirements. Um we will start a working group last call um um probably in um in a few weeks, uh, but I have to 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 consult my co-chair and uh we have a call for adoption 
um, for the US um, solution. And probably authentication format, I think we need to, I mean, it's hard to to get without the authentication format. So maybe we focus um, the, uh, the next interim meeting on the authentication formats. Sounds good to me. Okay, so thank you everyone for attending the meeting and see you um, next interim meeting. And on the list as well, please. Yeah, <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> Okay. Bye-bye. Thank you, everyone. Bye-bye.